Oh, that's crazy. So, um, all right, there's, um, okay, I see what's going on. Oh, well, uh, two, two of the pages on Facebook won't receive it because that was a link that Facebook didn't like uh, in the description. No big deal. Uh, we'll share that later, but uh, everything's on the channels it needs to be on. We're good. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, Dr. Rick Wallace, Dr. Michael Blanchard here. We are the teachers, and we have a very special guest as our first guest. And I think that it's 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 uh, only fair that she be the person to lead this off. Uh, I don't want to butcher her name, so I'm going to let Dr. Blanchard uh, introduce her. Uh, she's a longtime friend and associate. She's someone that I've known and been aware of probably about eight years, but uh, Dr. Blanchard a lot longer than that. And she's doing some unbelievable things on a number of different fronts. And so I'm going to open it up, Doc, uh, introduce this unbelievable person. And I, when I say unbelievable, you'll get to see what I mean. When, when she gets to talking. Absolutely. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let her tell her story, but I'll just briefly say that uh, I've known Sister Lateva Nabella Jingo for approximately about 30 years. I know her as a mother, an entrepreneur, a grassroots activist, an author, an educated, I'm sorry, an educator and a community organizer. Uh, based on that, I think she is the def definition of uh, liberation living. Uh, you know, black empowerment living. We call it living off the grid, independent living and, and self sufficient. Uh, so I met her probably around 92, 93. Uh, at the time, uh, her and her husband were running a, uh, a bookstore and a restaurant. And uh, Doctor cooked on the bean pies and the whiting fish sandwiches. If she remembers, she made a mean whiting fish sandwich. And that just had me coming back. So uh, imagine how she uh, uh, responded when this uh, young young black police officer is coming into uh, a conscious bookstore, right? right. So uh, needless to say, Sister Latava has been vetting me for 30 years. <laughs> and rightfully so with my background, right? I mean, we talk yeah. about vetting people so that we know yeah. whether people are actually legitimate right. grassroots uh, uh, boots on the ground. Uh, people because we have a lot of fakers out there you know we can we can get into that uh, and 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 i wanted to bring her on because i think it's important to um celebrate encourage and promote those that are actually doing boots on the ground work in our communities and because many times uh those that are doing uh the most work and get the uh, the best results are not the, those that, that that get the support and the money and doc you know you and i have talked about that uh, for years, you right, know, right, right. so, um, sister Latava, uh, basically, could you, you talk a little bit about the, her, uh, living campus and the services that you provide, um, to sure. the indigenous community, as well as services that you might provide across the country? Sure. Peace brothers. I appreciate you all uh, taking a moment for us to have this, this morning chat. Uh, her Living Campus, we are located in Indianapolis. We've been here for 17 years, 17 years. I've done the work that I do for 32 years. And her actually stands for Honor, Educate, and Restore. We honor our ancestors, educate our children, and restore our families. A lot of people don't uh, get as far as to understand what Her Living Campus is. So we're an immersive learning environment. We have healing spaces, we have um, therapeutic spaces, and we're centered on the celebration of black culture. So what we do is we cultivate and curate a lot of devoted space to education, trainings, and therapeutic healings. A lot of what goes on with us as a people to become whole. There are things we need to purge. There are things we need to disconnect from. There are things we need to immerse ourselves in. We maintain about seven uh, shrines and altars in our outdoor learning space. We are centered on the celebration of who we are as black people. So even if you come to Her Living Campus for an event as fantabulous as the Ultimate Cupcake Festival, 
where you might see all sorts of people, the vibe, the feel, the energy around everything that's going on is always truly us. So there are times when this safe space is exclusively utilized for our people. And then there are times when we open the door to share who we are and to share what we have with others. But that is what her living campus is. It's, it's a fantastic place. Talk a little bit about the uh, walk you just had. You just had a uh, community you store to raise money and tell yeah, us a little bit what that was. You see how this happened? He's getting me started right off the rip. Don't, don't say that walk that we just had. Let me tell you, one of our admins here, she's uh, Indianapolis community auntie, Shelly Covington. And I always tell people, remember that name, Shelly Covington. She is a competitive bodybuilder. To look at her, you would you would think she is not. You would think she just is the community auntie listing here. She's not just a community. She's not just a competitive bodybuilder. She brings home the gold. She transforms her body over the course of the year. Every year, she's been competing for about five years now, and she brings home the gold. And as I shared with people uh, before, we have uh, a huge project going on on campus right now. We unfortunately, earlier in the year, the roof of our workshop collapsed. And it's been a heck of a mess. We've just started demo. We got into this ugly fight with our insurance company. Needless to say, they've kind of left us hanging as 17 years worth of tools and supplies are hung up in this structure. So we had to do for self, which is our norm. Um, we often find that people who try to be self-sufficient are often left hanging by mainstream means like carrying insurance. Doesn't go as smoothly as it should. So casually one day she tells me, she says, you know what, Chief, I'm gonna help raise some money for this workshop because it's gonna cost us about $62,000 to tear this down and, and uh, try to do the rebuild. She's I'm gonna do a cross city walk. And she said it so casually, literally, she's leaving campus. She's in her vehicle, leaving campus, and I'm outside working. And I just threw my hand up and said, okay, yeah, let me know what you need, no problem. That particular admin, we've been friends since childhood. So we've got 50 years behind us. So she says, um, weeks later, you know, I, I'm getting to the point where I'm mapping out my route and this that, and the other. It's going to be great. We're going to get money, get people to donate money per mile. And I'll let you know how it's going. Sounds good. Two days before she's setting out for this walk, she did tell me I'm going to start at 7 a.m. and I think I'll be there at my goal about 5 p.m. She said, you know, I've done this a time or so before, but I was 100, uh, what she tell me, I was 60 pounds heavier. She's, she's lost like 125 pounds. I'm telling all her business, but we're here now. So she says, I was 60 pounds heavier. I'm sure I can make better time now. This is what I'm going to do, this and the other. So two days before the walk, she has me, listen, this is how casual. She shoots me over a map in an email and then she comes and shows me see this is my this is this is where i'm gonna go i look at this thing said the hell are you talking about what are you, what are you talking about this is listen this is she says yes yeah, about 27 miles i said listen a marathon is 26 miles that's not something you casually tell somebody you're gonna do right it's two days before <laughs> so I us, can't see morning and when I say there's so few people I would be up leaving my house for at dark 30 a.m., this was before coffee, before chickens, before any of that gets done. Here I am at the start of a walk. And this sister walked from 42nd and Midhoffer. And, and Brother Michael, you know where this is. Yeah. 42nd and Midhoffer to, um, where does she go? The Meyer out in uh, Hendricks County. Wow. I mean, she walked and she intentionally walked through every zip code that the mayor says is all these trouble crime ridden areas. Mm. She walked and then here was the, the, the really wild part. I look up and she's she's online telling people, maybe you could just donate a dollar a mile. 
And if you don't have a dollar a mile, maybe 50 cents a mile. And, and I'm going, what the hell are you saying? This is the walk, 27 miles. And you know, I was pissed. I'm saying ain't no way in the world that we, everybody who benefits from her activism, we should not have allowed her to ask us for a dollar a mile. Because every weekend, every single weekend, she knows every event going on in the city and she makes her rounds and she goes and spends money with all these black businesses every weekend. She had not let a weekend pass. And so, you know, um, I took the disposition that if this supporter of who we are in all our efforts asks you to support her, we need to show up. And we need to show up bodaciously. And most certainly, uh, it is it is something to be said for the level, because one of our first study guys here to be part of what we're doing is called Commitment is the Key. It's something to be said about that level of commitment. That level of commitment that, that you have someone that's so committed in what we are collectively doing as someone who believes so fervently in what we are standing for that if we wanted to quit, she's like, nope, I'm going to do something to help push us forward. And so that's what we're doing right now. We are raising funds to rebuild uh, our workshop, which is the heart and soul of most programming we do here. So just to segue into another question, uh, you bring up the challenges of uh, living a life of Black liberation. Can you right. maybe expand upon that, the difficulty? You and I had a conversation uh, when I visited the, the HER campus this past summer. Uh, you know, the yeah. difficulty and the challenges. Obviously, there are financial challenges. But um, what, what, what specific challenges do you have? And how, how can the community, how can uh, Dr. Wallace and other uh, people help your, your mission and your, and your goal? Because I know, like we said earlier, a lot of the best grassroots, the most effective people are are, are footing uh, their programs on their own dime. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I try to tell people all the time. Liberation living, the first understanding you need to have is that you must take responsibility for yourself. I can't put it any plainer than you are on your own. If you are genuinely going to stand to resist oppression, you have to, to be prepared to shoulder the full weight of responsibility for your safety, for your health, for your provisions, for your maintenance, for your education, for the education of your children. You have to be prepared to shoulder all of that. You know, we didn't homeschool because we had this religious commitment to not being part of the white man's world. We homeschooled because I was committed to my children being deeply rooted in their certain self-identity before they engaged and encountered other people. Like I can actually remember, I've got a daughter, let's see, when you and I met, that would be Latifa. she's about 28 now. Latifah would have been the baby then. And I can remember the day she first, first ever saw a white person. Mm. I can remember the day and her reaction because she literally was only around people who looked like her. Mm. And that was very, I mean, I was a very calculated parent. Fortunately, all my children are adults now. But uh, another thing you never prepared for. <laughs> right. I, heard, I heard you, uh, well, I read where you, you said the other day, and I'm paraphrasing, that before I ever experienced my, uh, exposed my children to any outside ideologies, I yeah. made sure that they had a complete anchoring and footing in their own identity. Completely. And in and, and, and 100%. Here. I think yeah, that's I that, the biggest problem we have. That, that's huge. My youngest children uh, will be 21 in February, it's a, a set of twins. And I can remember a, a school project that they had where they had to make a list. You know, my children were always busy in their childhood. 
always busy. They had dance class two or three times a week, martial arts two or three times a week. They were always camping. I mean, it was constant, immersive learning. And um, when they were nine, they were soon to be 10, which was a big deal for us, double digits. Oh, it was serious stuff because, you know, my daughters, when they turned 10, then they could wear nail polish. So everybody was looking forward to this double digit stuff. This was supposed to mean something. And uh, I remember having them make a list of all the families that they socialize with on a regular basis, every family that they knew. And, and they, they know so many people. They know so many people. And they're writing their list. And they're writing their list. Then they had to write a second list of how many families whose homes they go to visit with out their parents present. And so they've got this long list of like 50 people, you know, there's 50 families. And then they've got this list of like five. Mm. And then nine years old, looking forward to their 10th birthday. And it's just like, I can remember Fatima saying, it just seems like we're always going somewhere to someone's house. We just always feel like we're so busy. I needed them to recognize that they're going to be 10 soon and a whole huge world was going to open up to them. They needed to understand that as big as their world felt, it was going to blast open. It was just going to grow by quantum leaps because they really were being reared in a community of people they had been cultivated with their entire lives. There was no need. And I, I mean, you know, some of your viewers may watch this and they're like, that's ridiculous. Those kids went to the doctor, this and the other. I'm telling you, from the time they were born, they didn't see another physician until they were 13 and preparing for passport, you know, preparing to leave the country for, for vacation. This, this was not our normal, regular occurrence. And that's something that people don't want to really take on is the responsibility for self. Our people are hugely dependent on people that they know don't love them, don't like them, don't respect them, and don't have their best interests at heart. But I got to trust them with my child's mind. I have to trust them with my child's health. I have to trust them with my child's spirit. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding? You know how hard it is to raise children when you do have full control? So how do you think it's going to go with someone who does not have your interest at the forefront of their existence, but they have your children? You think new math is your problem? Oh, new math is not your problem. New math is not your You have zero control, and that's what people fail to understand. If you're raising children today, you are not the greatest influence over those children. You are not. Nothing going on in your family, your household, in your mind. I'm telling you, children today who are primarily reared and cultivated in a colonized environment, mm -hmm. you think, see, old school, we were required to read books like The Diary of Anna Frank. Today, if you were to rewrite that story using today's time, millennial parents trying to raise their children, Anne Frank would have turned her parents in if you were writing that story today because they are entrenched, entrenched in their enemies' indoctrination. Mm. Entrenched. And my children were raised with a deep, deep us and them. Deep us and them. There was no way in hell my children were going to get to believe that somebody outside of this family, somebody outside of this family was going to get to dictate what was happening in here. No way. Hmm. Mm -mm. You also recently put out a quote about the use of cell phones, if you know what I'm talking about. You just, just the last couple of days, you said, talked about uh, encouraging parents to, you know, put the cell phone down, you know, all of those yeah. things will be there when they become an adult. Could you maybe yeah. explain about a, a little bit about that? 
that quote that you my my children got cell phones when they graduated high school <laughs> I, you don't need to i i mean what, what more does it need to explain the twins got cell phones when they were about to turn 16 because they were 15 i apologize they got cell phones at 15 they had not graduated high school but they got those cell phones because we were moving out of the country and i wanted to make sure they always had unfiltered communication with their father because their father and i had divorced but we were still co-parenting and i never wanted to put myself in a position where we had some type of you know grafted uh communication when it came to these children they were very fluid in their their flow between the two households and and whatever the necessary uh get down was going to be but because we were moving out of the country and the three youngest children were going with me that meant the two youngest children got cell phones before we left so that they could have that communication but other than that everybody else could tell you you got a cell phone in my mama house that was a graduation gift in fact they all their computer time all their computer time, screen time in this household, we always had one television on campus ever. No televisions in the bedroom. There was only one television. It was in community space. And all children, and we've had plenty of computers around here, all computers were in communal space. All mm -hmm. screens faced open, and they had limited time. They used to have to earn 30-minute computer passes. And even my grandchildren, when my grandchildren come to visit, you might as well leave those devices in the car or at home or wherever because it's too much to do. Learn to make something, do something. Don't say you're bored. We got plenty to do. Man, ooh, you, you hit a you hit a you hit a thing on the nail. One of the challenges that we have, and we are very aware, but we and I'm honest, we are nowhere close to being on it like that as far as devices. Uh, our kids were teenagers when they got devices, but definitely not high school. Now, in retro, uh, in in, uh, in retro th thought and in hindsight, I mean, I wish I would have set that standard a long time ago because a great deal of the battle is trying to control a narrative and an idea, an Afrocentric perspective, which creates the love of self, starts with self and starts in the home. But if you got somebody in your home via device that's countering what you're taking and they're spending more time with the device than they're spending with you, who do you think winning? Well, you just you just clarified it right there. Most parents give their children devices because they don't want to take the responsibility of engaging with their children. Mm. That's not an easy thing. I mean, we love our children. They're not always likable. <laughs> and they are, they are hella work. They are hell at work. I mean, Let's I'm not. Real. Let's be real. I was in love with motherhood. But listen here, I, I had to be intentional to not call them people out of their names before they became adults. But now, I, <laughs> let me tell you, they grow now. And sometimes I have to catch resolution. Now, I usually cuss. So beep this out if you need to. But I had to, my children would tell you, I mean, look, you motherfuckers is getting ready to make me. You understand what I'm right. saying? Yo, I got this whole thing twisted. If that's what, you know, because they're adults now, I have to bring them back to reality. Hold it. No. You know, but the, the problem is, really, parents give up. I mean, mm. a lot of parents have surrendered. But my children, I would always say, where are they going to be that they're not going to be with an adult who has a phone? Do they want to take responsibility for where are your children? Who's got... Who's got governance of your children? My children couldn't go anywhere with anyone who was not going to be 100% responsible for their safety and well-being. Mm. And I remember my daughters, two of my daughters came to me as young adults and were telling me, you know, you get, it's the talk. You get the talk. When your children are adults, they're new adults, every parent, I've, I've got to tell myself that every parent gets the talk. I can't, I got to say it wasn't just me. But you get this talk where they're going to give you an assessment now of, how you did as a parent and one of the embarrassing moments, you know, I got all the good criticisms because they've got, they've got this thing figured out now. And now they realize, you know, there's things you could have done better. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, I've got this t-shirt a friend of mine made for me that says you're fucking welcome. Because usually when my children come to me complaining about something, I tell them, oh, you're fucking welcome. You know, <laughs> you get grown and <laughs> tell it to your therapist. But, um, so don't do that part. That's not the part of the parenting manual you go and follow because I'm cold, cold blooded with it. <laughs> So <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, all right, you don't want to talk to your dad about that because he's going he to sit there and play the violin for you. He's coming with the full orchestra. Mommy's having none of that. But um, the, the truth of the matter is parents have surrendered. And when those daughters complained to me, their complaint was, we couldn't go and visit our friends' houses, you know, after your double digits and you've uh, rallied a few friends there, you say 14. If we went to visit a friend's house, you had to meet the parents, have a talk with the parents, and then you'd always say that embarrassing thing. This was the embarrassing thing. Now, this is my daughter. I'm leaving her here with you. I expect her to be well behaved. She is in your care. I'm leaving her here in good repair, but what you should know, I'm expected to pick her up in the same condition I've dropped her off. If something happens to my child while I'm gone, you ought to know. It's you I'm coming to see. I'm not going to see the person down the street. No, not your cousin, so-and-so. I'm coming to see you. You are 100% responsible for what goes on with my child. Now, if that's not a responsibility you're willing to take, I'm not mad at you, but she can't stay here. She's right. not going to be able to be here. And most parents don't want to take that position because, one, you want your child to like you. I couldn't afford to give a damn about that. You want to not only want them to like you, you don't want to be the party pooper. I have a job to do. My commitment started day one. And I'm up against a constant force that is constantly infiltrating. When you mention you've got this device and you've got somebody coming in 24-7, they spend more time with the device than they do their parents. But that's on the parents. You know, when I said my children were always busy, we camped. You know, we left here one year. We were gone for two months, camped cross country. And I mean tent camping in all kinds of terrains, cross country. That, that's how it went. And if you're not willing to spend that type of time and invest that type of energy in your children, mm. there's, where, there's where the real get down is. We, we let go. It isn't that they came in and took our children. We gave them up. We surrendered. And, and, and when you put it like that, I, I, I think that that's something that I teach my clients uh, when I'm talking about enhancing and growing themselves intentionally. Uh, mm -hmm. life, will, life will grow you, but when you don't have an intention of where you're trying to go, mm -hmm. it tends to take a longer time to get there. And you take a lot more yeah. bumps and bruises than you have to, and you deal with some things. But when you grow intentionally, you have a set purpose. And you set up there. But what I tell them all the time is you got to start labeling that thing. You shouldn't be doing what it really is. Stop dressing it up. Stop romanticizing it. The thing is, that thing you're calling reassessment, you're quitting. Yeah. That's what it actually is. And yeah. are, you, are you a quitter? Well, the thing is, what you just described, a, a, we, us as a group or a race yeah. quitting and saying, we want to do this or this and that. And the truth of the matter is, most people aren't prepared to be parents. I know I wasn't when I stepped out. I didn't have the rooting and footing. Now, I had parents who were probably the strictest parents in the neighborhood. I was the kid with the whole the beat the lights home rule. Mm -hmm. No, you can't go in anybody's house. None of your friends can come in my house. And if mm -hmm. I hear about you being in somebody's house, I'm going to whoop yeah, your ass. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I got I got whippings that, that were beyond whippings. What will be classified now as abuse? Oh, I went way beyond that. And, and, and I'm not glorifying that. But what I'm saying is I came from that, but there was still so much that wasn't. Now, again, I couldn't watch everything, couldn't listen to everything. My music was hand selected. Hmm. By, by, and I was reared by my great grandparents. I'm literally reared by my grandmother's parents. Yeah. So their idea of what's acceptable it's generations behind generations where I grew up. Sure. So I'm looking up sure. and they get to go and they, I couldn't even say that. And that's something my kids never got to say is, well, they, I don't want to hear about they. Oh, no. You yeah. can't even do that in my house about your own siblings. Well, she got, we're not talking about her. We're talking about you. Y'all individuals. Y'all each have own, your own responsibility. She's probably getting to do something because she did what I asked her to do. But at mm -hmm. the same time, 
listening to someone that has done it at the level you've done it, I can admit there were some places I missed because I had bought into a piece of the lie. It's more important to be out there getting that paper, which had me away from the house. You know, we well, can make it easier. I'm, I'm, I'm one, I don't want to give this uh, African to, I don't want you to think it makes it easier because my children still had to become adults navigating this world. And although they were many moons and quantum leaps ahead of their peers, they often felt behind. They felt like they had missed something. Like my children felt like they missed the hood. I mean, they felt like they missed something because the average peer that they would encounter, and because I have mostly daughters, I've got six daughters. Um, when it comes to the selections for young women right now, when it comes to brothers, we're not rearing sons in today's market. You're finding very few young men who are being reared and cultivated to become men mm. uh, and become husbands and become providers and become fathers. They're not being cultivated for that. So the men my daughters grew up with, their fathers, their brothers, were not the young men they were encountering in the streets. And so these young men were feeding my daughters this diet this social diet of what's wrong with you? Like I, I met a brother who told me he was present when one of my daughters had her first hamburger and how they were socializing a group of them. And she was saying, I've never had a hamburger in my life. And he was saying, do you know you're the only person here who could actually say that? Like he was admiring it, but for her socially, she felt the pressure awesome. that yeah. I was behind. I'm I'm underdeveloped. You, you understand what I'm saying? So there's that. You're going to catch it either way. It's damned if you do, damned if you don't, if you're a parent. But there's a serious thing. Like, in contrast, your, your parents were very strict. I grew up really from a, a poly perspective. And we had probably far less supervision than we should have. We had a, a great deal of unfiltered... Um, information. One of my favorite people as a child was uh, Dr. Ruth. If, if you both can remember who Dr. Ruth was. <laughs> right, you know, right, right. I thought I was going to grow up and become a sex therapist. That was going to be my occupation. And so we had all this information. But one thing for sure, as much as we had this, un, uh, this overexposure to society, my father was very adamant that we learned to make decisions and that we were accountable for whatever we chose. And that's, that's the reality at hand. You could do anything you wanted to, as long as you had an intelligent reason why. But if you come in here with that, well, they said, first thing you're going to hear is, well, they don't run shit in here. That's the first thing my father is going to say, whatever this day is you're talking about. I was fortunate to be reared with a healthy lack of respect for Caucasian authority. That was not something I was reared with. I was reared understanding that at best they are peers, but in no way superior. And um, I was raised with a healthy balance of my mother who was extraordinarily religious and my father who was quite anti-religion. He was quite anti-organized uh, religion. Hmm. Ultimately, I landed somewhere I feel like I'm, I'm pretty balanced now. My children were reared, initially, I, I raised my older children, uh, deeply rooted in the nation of Islam. So it did give us a discipline, which my father suggested that I study because I was wildly out of control as a young adult. And he thought it would be good for uh, discipline. And it was. And it was very helpful in, in honing in a lot of the, the, the raw rearing that I had received as a child. Additionally, once I parted ways with the nation, I maintained all the quality things that I had gained from there. But that comes from my rearing. My father taught us, you know, not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, you need to move forward with the benefit of things you've gained in life. So dietary habits and a sense of modesty and reasonability um, and an unwavering footing when it comes to self 
um, not just awareness, but my peace. Like I won't have my peace disturbed. And so you carve out those places where you must have safety, you must have peace, and you're willing to do whatever is necessary to protect and enforce that peace. And that, that leads me to a lot of the conflict we have. Like I had a problem with churches doing buyback programs and being in bed with um, state and federal governments. It was just too deeply entrenched mm -hmm. because where the campus is, about a half a mile south of us is a outdoor firing range. And a lot of uh, Caucasian church groups that have gun clubs utilize that range and you see they have youth days and things of that nature. But in the black community, we have gun buyback programs and safe surrender where people with, with warrants can turn themselves in to the federal agents or the state agents within a church facility. And I, I just have a, a big problem with that level of conflict of interest. And I don't believe in disarming our people. I believe our people need firearm education. They don't need to be disarmed, including our children. And I know we're losing a lot of children to gun violence, but we're losing a lot of children to lack of gun education. We're, we're losing a lot of our, our people to lack of conflict resolution, lack of mental health services. Um, and people are in survival mode and some of them aren't in survival mode, they're just fools. There used to be an app for fools. Hmm. You know, what you call child abuse by today's standards. I can remember telling my children, quite frankly, if you ask my children right now, oh, if I gave the two word warning, if I, uh, uh, two words, those two words were child abuse. I'm not even going to label this something else. I'm not going to tell you I'm very disciplined. You look here. If we can't have this conversation, I can tell you right now, and you can call who you want to call. The only person going out of here is you. I, I mean, we might as well be straight up with it because if you make me get up and have to put my hands on you, what's going to happen is going to be classified as child abuse. And today, right now, on my door, there's a warning sign right on my door. Warning, I whoop other people's children. <laughs> Something you said uh, that I want to bounce back on because it's such a passion of mine is that we aren't rearing young boys to be men. Uh, and mm -hmm. that's a big portion of what I do with Black Men Lead is create a rite of passage initiative and the cultivation of what's taught afterwards. So anywhere from four to 13 and then moving to 30 is what we try to target. But the thing is, uh, when you remove a strong presence of uh, Black manhood, when Black manhood is constantly targeted in many different ways, Black masculinity is targeted in many ways. And then the example of what manhood is, is thwarted and constantly fed. And then there's no true modeling of it in close proximity. You get kids who are moving into the physiological process of becoming a man where testosterone levels rise, where strength increases, where there's a natural aggression that comes with the testosterone that they don't understand and then they turn in on one another or they turn in on the very ones that testosterone and increased strength was given to them to protect. And so what we do is we explain to young boys at a certain time, you're going to start to see differences between you and your female peers. You know, mm -hmm. up until about seven, eight or nine, y'all are pretty much equal. Mm -hmm. She might she might even whoop you. Mm -hmm. And so, but after a while, you're going to start to see a difference in size, a difference in strength. And you're going to develop an aggression. Let me explain something to you. All of those things you experience in this change that you go through when you go through pu puberty and moving to adolescence, it's meant to protect her. Yeah. She is your first responsibility. The female in the community needs to know she's safe because she can do some exceptional stuff when she's safe. The problem is not enough of us are making them safe. That's my word. But the thing is, I want you to elaborate on the fact because... I get, I mean, I, 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 right now I'm under heavy attack from the, the alphabet people because yeah. I'm talking about how there's an intense agenda on the feminization of the black male image. And when I talk about feminization of the black male image, I'm, I'm moving beyond homosexuality. I'm mm -hmm. talking about 
they're looking for ways to emasculate and feminize straight men. So there's no there's no base in your voice. There's no squaring of your shoulders. There's no absolute stance in our community. If you come in here and you touch her or you touch these babies or you touch these elders or you even mishandle our boys, I don't care who you are. We going to touch you uh -huh. when you feminize them. They don't have that resolve. They want to get along. They want to be compliant. They want to be accepted. We don't need black men who want to be accepted. We need black men who want to step up. Well, if you ask me to expound on that, okay, buckle up. So, y'all, when she said buckle up, I mean, she needed it, seriously. Uh, first of all, talk therapy doesn't work <clears throat> for children, generally speaking, and especially not young black men not in this society that is attacking them from the time they get here. So we start there. My father gave me exactly one whooping my entire life. He went to his grave swearing he never actually gave me the whooping. And I assure you, he's been gone 26 years. He absolutely did. Um, but the reason he gave me only one whoop in my entire life was definitely not because I was an angel of a child. I, I put the best of them to the test. My father gave me exactly one whoop because it was never necessary for him to give me but that one whoop. And he gave me that one only because he promised in a threat that that's what would happen. Our children, all of them, are not being reared in a community where men are present. Mm. Here we go. A lot of people I love, well, I can't say a lot of people I love, but I love enough people personally that I share community and family with who happen to be in the homosexual community. And I can tell you definitively because of the era in which I grew up. See, I grew up right around the corner down the street from a key club. If you don't know what a key club is, Google it. We'll talk about it another time. Um, so there was a lot of sexual liberation in the era in which we grew up. It was not the homosexuals who made our... I'm going to tell you what introduced this effeminization. And I don't usually share about this because I've never been sure if I was going to write about it, but I studied it a lot, but I'll share with you. Think back. The characteristics of the feminization of our boys came from pimps. The way they talked to each other, the way they carried themselves, the way they referred to each other as sugar and baby and daddy. Uh, that high-pitched tone in their voice that they would intentionally use. That was not something that was common amongst gay males back in the day. And if you go back and look at enough old school music videos, you can see flamboyantly gay males who did not behave in that manner. But I bet you, if you go back and look at any old school pimp movies, and even today, what is portrayed as a pimp in our community, how does he talk? How does he walk? How does he dress? How does he behave? What's his tone look like? So we don't like to talk about that. And we don't like to talk about the fact that it was not just our daughters who were not safe among predatory males in a family. We don't like to talk about that. We don't like to talk about the fact that the same way we understand that slavery was abolished except as a punishment for crime, same way we don't want to talk about that, that part of that slavery was buck breaking. We don't like to talk about that. We don't like to talk about that. In today, 2021 prison culture, there are marriage wards and homosexual runs rampant in those prisons. And then you release those adult males after having them contain all of their child rearing years. Then you release them back onto a society where they've grown accustomed to screwing male, even though that wasn't the way they went in. Little clever things of gay for the stay. We don't like to talk about that. We don't like to talk about the systemic turnout of our brothers. But more even than that, A brother can only help make my son a man if I put the ingredients there for him to be so. I didn't raise my sons in fear. 
I did not allow them to hide behind my skirt. I had a strict policy of not saving my son from other brothers. No matter the threat, no matter the problem, exactly one time that I intervened with my youngest son having a problem with an older brother. And that older brother happened to be his brother, who is, is he 16 years older than he? So my boys, it's only two of them. One is the second from the top, and the other is the very end of the end. So they bookend practically, right? And the only reason I intervened at that time, and it was an ugly, heated scenario, but I, I wouldn't step in because I always took the position as my son's mother, unless he asked me for help, he feels like he's got it. If he looks to me, I'm going to give him some good advice on how to navigate it. But he's got to be able to handle himself amongst men. He's got to be able to be uncomfortable amongst them. He's got to be able to hold his own amongst them. But that started with me because I'm the one. I'm the root and soil system. Then it goes to you two. The brothers in the community, there's no such thing as not being allowed to be present because black men know that you're being haunted and hunted and killed and warehoused. You know that. So you can't wait for someone to say, well, I took care of my son. You have to be able to see all the knuckleheads on the block, all the knuckleheads that live in your area or the area you used to live in, and you've got to be able to step in because you know what it would have been if you didn't have somebody. And because we've got so many brothers not willing to stand in the gap, there's no such thing as nobody would let me be the man. There's nothing either of you could do. You and everybody you know with you couldn't stop me from being a woman. Mm. Not you and every man you know could show up. And y'all can't stop me in my womanhood. You ain't man enough to keep me from being a woman. Mm. Mm. That's it, bottom line. So when you hear me talk forceful, it's because I can't afford to allow you to make my son weak. I can't afford it. Mm. His life depends on it. I can't afford it. And I can tell you, I, I, there's a brother who's pretty dear to me today. The first day I met him, we were, we just happened to be in a community meeting together. And I remember leaning over saying something to him because my son, who's now 20, who was about 11 or 12 at the time, spoke up in this uh, community summit that was centered around youth. And I taught my children at any time your category is being discussed, you ought to have something to say. By that, I mean your age group, your race, your gender, you know, any classification you fit in. They talking about black women, I got something to say about that. You, you understand what I'm saying? You should have something to say when it comes to your category. In this particular situation, the brother kind of questioned and challenged what my son said because some young people had walked out of a school and they were being threatened with being arrested. But they were standing up for what they believed in, standing up for justice. And the brother, who happened to be sitting in the row I was sitting in, I intentionally did not sit with my children. He said, yeah, but you, you want to you wanna stand up for it? You want to go to jail? I think the brother, whatever he said, ended with, do you want to go to jail? And I distinctly remember my youngest son saying, nobody wants to go to jail, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And it happened to be two empty seats between me and this brother who I later came to know pretty well, but at the time had never met before. I leaned over to him and I said, hey man, I don't know how you came to be in a room that I'm sitting in, but you see what I did there? You see him, if you see him, don't you fucking open your mouth. Because you kind of instill fear in my son, and I don't do fear monger. And I know he must have thought, this one, she's going to stab me or something. Girl, I was so serious. I don't know what you got going on, where you done came from. I had no idea who he was. But what I did know is that he was instilling fear. My enemy's fear in my son, thinking he's looking out for me. Right. And I can't afford it. He thinks he's protecting him like, hey man, you don't want to you don't want to get in trouble. Don't tell my son that because some shit's gonna be worth getting in trouble. Don't tell my son he don't want to go to jail because I raised him with a healthy understanding that something gotta be worth it. 
I raised my children to understand. Nobody wants negative circumstances, but there's a short list of shit that something's got to be worth it to you. And the problem we got in the black community is too many grown people that ain't nothing worth it. Nothing. Mm. Your children ain't worth it. You will stand on the news and and sit there and uh, I, I just need some answers. I need to know. And could you pray for the safety of my family? What the hell are you talking about? What are you talking about? I, I've said this for a hundred years. I cannot promise you. I can't promise you. I could not promise my children. Cannot promise you that these crackers won't kill my kids. I can't promise you that. But I can damn sure promise you they won't kill him for free. Mm. I, can that's it. I can yeah. promise you that. I can promise you you will never see mascara running on this face. You might decide to take my child. I can never think I'm so black and proud and bold and powerful and I can keep you from killing my kid. But each one of us as an adult has it within our power to say, you will not kill my kid for free. And I mean that no matter who it is. Not Jaquan, not Josh, not Reverend so-and-so, not Mayor so-and-so, not Mrs. so-and-so, not Mrs. so-and-so. I will stand on your liver before you kill my kid for free. And I, I do not hesitate to say that I mean that with everything in me. Nothing would keep you here. We will never settle this in court. I've made peace with death. I ain't scared of jail. We okay with that. I got a short list. And that's all it takes to be free. Make a short list. This the shit I live for. This the shit you can die for. Mm. Short, mm. short list. It don't take volumes of books. It don't take, nope. It's got a it's a real short list. But Doc, you and I have had this conversation so many times. And you know, my one thing my grandfather taught me growing up, like I said, I was reared by my great grandfather. So one thing he taught me real sick, he saw me out when I was a little boy out, and I'm having a back and forth with a kid, and it's obviously aggressive, but we're exchanging words. He says, Stop spit boxing with that boy and hit it. Stop waiting exactly. on them to hit you. The way that you're going to settle right. is let him feel you. Be, 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 okay with take, boy, be okay with taking that ass whooping. But the moment exactly. that people know that you are willing to take that ass whooping, you're willing to take that bullet, you'll find out not that many really, not that many are really willing to give it for you. They'll come at you when they know you're going to bow down. When they know you before your kid is in the ground, you're going to be talking about forgiving them. Oh, oh, they, they coming for you. But I told I told my wife a long time ago, and she noticed. She knows she gets scared every time she watch watch me ride by and see somebody in the face of a black woman. I'm stopping. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, baby, mm -hmm. baby, 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 calm down. No, I'm stopping. I don't care who it is. Baby, that you know that boy just got killed a couple of weeks ago trying to defend that. Well, I tell you what, I can live with the legacy I'm gonna leave behind when That's my right. people know. Because now I told my boys, I didn't just teach you that. That's right. I'm living by them. That's one thing my sons know. I know for a fact if I tell my sons, hey, this cat over here doing something to your sister, he finna hear from them. That's right. But the bottom line is something you and I talk about, Doc, all the time. Dr. King, I didn't agree with everything he said, but one thing I ride on and down on, if a man ain't got nothing for which he's willing to die, he's not fit to live. That's mm. right. And that's the thing you got to have in your heart as a man. What are you willing to die for? They got you so afraid to die, you're going to die anyway. Mm -hmm. That's what we came what here for. My thing is, what are you going to leave behind when you die? I'm more worried about my legacy than I am my life. Absolutely. And and, that, and that's it. Like I tell people all the time, a whole bunch of stuff I used to be willing to die for. Stupid stuff. Dumb stuff. Dumb stuff. Dumb stuff. And you know, that list that she's talking about got real small. The stuff I'm willing to die for, that looks like that long now. But trust me, touch one of mine. And you're going to feel me. And I don't care who come out on top. Period. That, thing, that same energy, I live that energy community-wide and, and to this degree. I try to avail myself as a black woman and everything that means to every black child in my sphere. So children will not be abused in my sphere. Uh, you, you understand what I'm saying? 
Now, I can't control what's going on away from me, but I am a safe space. I'm a resourceful space. I am an asset to every relationship I participate in. I have to take that position, how I walk this earth. And that's a commitment I make, and therefore, each of us can take that commitment to whatever degree we feel empowered to do so, and we can move around this community and broaden the safety of that said community. Additionally, when we talk about um, how black men are present and how they show up for our sons, it's nice to have clever sayings like steel sharpens steel. But sometimes you have to do some sharp. See, here we have this thing where the brotherhood will take a brother for a walk. You, you understand what I'm saying? Not some optional. Come here, brother. Let me talk to you for a second. Let's go for a walk. Until you get to the place where you're willing to walk a brother off, sometimes y'all come back together. Y'all got to understand this. Sometimes you come along. But until that's a position you're willing to take, you can't build community. I remember years ago, someone asking me, do we police ourselves here on campus in our community? That's not a job description that happens here. You know, we got to watch you. You don't, don't need to be here. You have to have an aligned value with the people you share a community with. And you have to have a commitment and a responsibility to them. You see how early in this, this conversation started with me telling you, community auntie Shelly Covington handed me a map two days before her walk, 27 miles. She didn't discuss the details because she knew whatever she needed without even giving it no thousand dollar meeting for a $2 problem. Whatever she needed, she was gonna have. So from beginning to very end, <clears throat> the pit crew, we were there with her. And I was there from beginning to end. There are no seats of privilege here. These are seats of responsibility. You have to own full responsibility. That meant for 27 miles, this was to walk this entire city. But just like the deacons of defense that afforded Martin Luther King the luxury of taking his nonviolent position, you got the armor bearers who don't play that shit. Thank you. And, and, and that's what we don't like to discuss. If you're going to take full responsibility for yourself, then you cannot look to others. I can't help it. When I have to ask for financial support from our community, did you hear me say I'm an asset to every relationship I participate in? Oh, I guarantee you, I've, I've deposited into that relationship. Everybody who witnesses my work benefits from my work. Show me to be a liar. You know how I many people are raising chickens right now because they saw this black woman raising chickens? Mm. Do you know how many grown men I have helped get in touch with their gentler, peaceful side for the first time in their life putting a, a baby chick in their hand? You know how I many teenage boys that I've had the luxury of being able to help them find that they can bring peace and center to themselves by telling them, would you like to feed my chicken? And, and to tell them the only way they'll let you feed them is if you help them to feel that you are not a threat, that they are safe with you, and that you are at peace. Do you know how many of our children are so stressed out they don't even remember the last time they intentionally tried to center themselves? Hmm because they are living in fear. They're fighting a war that is born in fear and anxiety, and we don't want to address that. Hmm. So I do need to say we are raising funds. We must raise funds because as I've said to you, we are on our own. Here you have a black woman led community that is rebuilding a workshop that we've taken 17 years to cultivate. All of our tools, all of our resources, at, at the time when it collapsed, all of our seed bank was in that workshop. We've had to rebuild and regather tools, equipment, and opportunities to keep this place afloat while trying to recover from that scenario. And we do this on our own. And when I say on our own, I don't mean financially. 
we physically out there. If you look at my social media, you see when you say brother, boots right. on the ground. We just yesterday pull a shingle. You understand what I'm saying? We knocking buildings down just so we could try to get in there and put it in a position where we can level it for the rebuild. Why do I have to ask anybody to help support that, to push with me? Because black women have the tendency to be looked at as when we are strong, people expect that we will be stronger. We need support. We need help. And when you see black people pushing towards liberation, we all should be contributing to that. But right now, we're in the era of social media. And nobody wants to, you know, they want to be social media influencers. They want a vacation. They want to show all this bullshit. But that's not going to feed your legacy. And it's definitely not going to feed your legacy. Um, I definitely want you to be able to provide the listeners with a way that they can actually support because they are asking. I don't know if you guys can see the chat. I'm getting it. Um, no, I can't oh, see it, man. Yeah, okay. I can't even talk. Okay. There are a couple of things, that's a couple of things, but Doc, what I want you to do is we've talked, we've had the conversation, what she just talked about, we've had that conversation about uh, the inability to get the uh, the black community to really move. We talked about, uh, I've been doing this officially, I've been doing this all my life, but officially uh, the Odyssey Project came out of me being out there. The Odyssey Project used to be Odyssey Entertainment. Okay. I took a part of Odyssey Entertainment, turned it into the Odyssey Media Group. That became my publishing arm. So that was that. Another part became the Odyssey Project, which was complete community, black community involvement and everything that's come out of it. But in 20 years, I've raised $10,000. And, and, and the thing is, I, I get plenty of playtime. I get plenty of pats on the back. None of that stuff meaning to me. Not that I don't appreciate a person acknowledging me, but I didn't come here to be acknowledged. I didn't come here to be popular. I'm not trying to be your leader. I came here because I got something to offer you. I came here because I can touch your kids. I came here because I can give you something to fight with. I spent 30 years learning what they're doing to us, and I can tell you how to get around it. That's why I'm, here. I'm not here for you to like me, because some of the stuff I'm going to tell you going to make you mad at me. So that's yeah. the thing. But there are a few people who have gotten behind me. There are a couple of people who have done some things. But literally, in 20 years, we're talking right at $10,000. Everything else, man, the research alone has cost me more than that. So oh. I know what it's like. So my thing is, I want people to be able to see. Number one, if they can go to your Facebook page. And yeah. I think her, 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 her Facebook page is that's that. It's her name. Uh, and you should yeah. be able to. Okay, with my Right. It, you go you go there, you look at it, you can literally see the work. I've seen bulldozers on the property trying to get stuff. Mm -hmm. I see them out there working. I've watched her raving. My wife and I marvel at what they're doing because literally you can talk all day long, but if you're dependent upon the oppressor, you cannot liberate yourselves by saying, We need, I need, we're gonna do this, we need you to do this. If I'm sitting up begging a politician for something, it's because I haven't seen the truth in who I am because they are not going to give it to you. Now, they'll talk to you. They, they're real good with smoothing you over. They rub, you, they rub you smooth on the back. They're good with that, but they're going to kick you in the butt. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So my thing is I want uh, you guys to go to her page and check her out. Uh, definitely show her some love, show her some support. Like I tell you before, people get mad at me and my organization because I don't ask enough. And that's just how I'm built. After a while, the moment I feel like I'm begging somebody to do something, I'm like, no, don't worry about it. I'll do it. And my wife is looking at me like, you know, you're doing that from resources that you. I, so now I got to say, OK, now, baby, we're going to be good. But I'm going to do this because the thing is, it's my purpose. It's so deeply in me. You know, I, I, I've, Doc, we've had these conversations Well, I'm like, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. I'm sitting up fighting for people who are fighting me. I'm done. And, and, and you said, I understand, Doc. And Doc has been one of those supporters. Doc has put his money where his yeah. mouth is, That's right. probably consistently more than anybody else. So, Doc, you know what you've done. I'm not going to put that out there, but you do. You that dude. Everybody That's, else, what, you know, that's what happens. Everybody doesn't have <clears throat> the skill set to be physically hands on deck. And it does take that. And it also takes financial resources. And it is a it's a big downfall when we don't have it in us to keep asking. I've had yeah. to overcome that because without the financial resources, you have to put more sweat equity in 
And these things, these physical things, they wear out. You know, a lot of people will mistake your age or, you know, because, oh, you look to be in such good shape. But, you know, you get up every morning and your coffee becomes your lubricant where you're stretching and trying to get ready for <laughs> you know, you're trying to get ready for this thing. But don't worry. Them, them cinder blocks let you know real quick. You are not 20 anymore. You know, they, they let you know who's the boss real quick. And a lot of times when I talk about, you know, us raising our sons to be men, we have a brotherhood that is lacking a work ethic. Mm. This is it's an unfortunate truth. And I, I believe in intellectual uh, assets. You know, I believe in being able to have your, your intellectual assets intact. I do know I have a, a post on my page running where I'm asking, what do spouses do when their partner's playing their, their video game system? And I ask that. It's almost facetious because my mind was thinking, you know, bakers, a baker's son usually learns to bake. A banker's son usually learns banking. The bridge builder's son learns to build bridges. The carpenter's son usually learns carpentry. What does the gamer's kid learn? Hmm. If the hunters teaches, if the hunter teaches his son to hunt, what does the gamer teach their child? And we have partners right now, people who are in relationships, who they really are hung up in this whole gaming life and. You know, that's that might be anybody's thing. Mm. But what else is there? Because you will teach your child what you know. You will teach them that that's the measurement of manhood. So if you think that, what did you grow up seeing your father do? My father went to work. My father hung out after work drinking with his friends. And he, and he took me with him on a regular basis. And the friends that he drank with after work were dentists, architects. You understand what I'm saying? These weren't low lives. These was men who had their own businesses, were gainfully employed, well educated. They were musicians and they got together after work and they drank and socialized and enjoyed one another's company and went home. And so what are we teaching our children that it means to have a man in the house? So when I say our, our children are not growing up with men, you know, my father as a man taught me what to uh, view as quality manhood. And I got a good eye. I have a good eye for quality black men. Mm. I, can, I can pick them out of a deep crowd. <laughs> but that being said, people who find it difficult to support, difficult to roll up their sleeves, difficult to get dirty, they think that's a claim to something, that's a, a sign of status, the sheeple. And I can't say that I won't fight. I just won't fight for everyone. I no longer do that. Mm. I do not fight for everyone. Because I will care more about whether they eat than they do. And I don't. And that's, that's something that people like you are going to struggle with because you don't want to see somebody's child hungry. That's, that's a hard thing to tell you. If you're going to graduate to your next level, you're going to have to be willing to see somebody else's kid hungry because they're willing to see them hungry. Mm. Yep. That, and, and, and that that's the biggest part of me. And, and, and I've heard this before, and it's always come from people I respect. And, you mm. know, like, you know, I, I, I could dismiss that if it was coming from people that I can look at and say, you ain't doing crap. But mm -hmm. when it comes from people and you say, okay, this person has made an imprint. And not that I don't feel I have, but I know that I have something to do. And I think I'm hung up on the fact that I can't walk by somebody that don't want to get up. I literally get caught up in those moments trying to stop and say, come on, come on, come on. And they, they, they're not moving. And not only are they not moving, and not only are they not moving, they're not into what I'm doing because they bought into I'll just sit here and catch the crumbs. They are content with it. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, like you said, if, if you don't get to the point where you say, okay, I got to take the warriors that want to go and we got to go. Maybe at some point we'll conquer this thing and we, then we'll look out for you. But the thing is, we're literally 
fighting for every ounce and inch that we get. Because the truth of the matter is something else I've learned. If they come, them, you know, you talked about us and them at the beginning. If they come, they come in with an agenda. So even when it looks like they blessing you, you better be looking for the leak. I can tell you when they come, they're, they're looking for the education. They'll be with you for a, a time, but I guarantee you they're, they'll be off after a year or two, they'll be off selling at a premium what you taught them to do. I don't, I don't even give tours to them. They don't even tour this campus because they're very interesting in getting in. Hmm. Well, what are you guys doing? What are, what are you? And and right now, I need I need a grant writer. I've worked with a couple of them that can't seem to to come through as far as actually getting started on the work. I don't mean produce. I mean get started on the work. But you know who will volunteer? Them. <laughs> them. Oh, because they just need to know everything that you got going on. Just show us everything you've got going on. Right. But we don't we don't want to do that because we've got this idea. We've got an idea. But the unfortunate reality is if you're going to make moves, you're going to have to be OK uh, seeing someone else's child hungry. Just remember, the shot clock is running. The shot mm -hmm. clock is running, brother. That's how you're going to have to view. There's only so much time and resources I can contribute to what you've got going on. And then what you're really not going to like, what you're really not going to like is later that will include even your own children. Hmm. Ooh. Tell me about it. That's Tell what me. you're really not going to like. Oh, I'm because not, I'm you not 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 our children won't get to know us until we're gone. You, you understand what I'm saying? If you ever have to stand in that spot with them, they won't really get to know your heart until you're gone. And they'll get that from other people. But in the moment, it'll just sound like you're crazy. And and that, that old saying of by the time you realize your mother was right, you probably got a daughter who thinks you're wrong and vice versa. By the time you realize your father was right, you probably got a son who thinks you're wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a that's a curse. We're on repeat marking time at that point. But when when it comes down to seeing somebody else's child hungry, you got to ask yourself, is their parent OK with that? I'm sorry you were born to a coward. I'm sorry you were born to an idiot. You know, be nice if something else could have happened. Mm. And you offer that child a resource, a word, or something that you hope they'll remember later down the line. And they do, some of them, some of them. But um, the fact of the matter is, if the person who brought you here doesn't value, I know we like to romanticize the, the idea of childbirth. Everybody comes with a purpose. Well, some people's purpose is to die. We got to stop thinking that everybody came here with this higher calling because I just I just know that's not the case. You know, some people came here unexpectedly. There's a reason we call it. Oh, she's expecting expecting what? Used to be children were coming to be received by a community. Well, what of the spirits who are not being expected or welcomed? or received what were they cultivated in come on we got to be deeper than what we on. some of us know more than we we living off of what mm -hmm. about them that's why they you can't get them to see the value in your kid because they don't see the value in themselves because there was no value put in them they see your child the same way they see themselves valueless what are you talking to what are you what are you trying to tap into this is this is a rough set of circumstances here it's a shot clock. We're at a, we're at a stage. This is becoming a slave planet. The entire planet is a plantation. Not this country. The entire planet is a plantation. And to tell people, listen, man, they've left the, the planet, not left the country. Offshore banking used to be a big deal. It's not a big deal anymore. Hmm. They've left the surface, the crust of this planet. You're not paying attention to this? Y'all watched Hunger Games and ignored the fact that this country already exists in district. 
Does it not? Are we unaware of this? The United States of America is already divided in districts. Hmm. Excuse me. Soon. Is there an urgent need? Thank you for visiting. Because, you know. But that, that's the reality. This country is already in districts. And all you have to do is think back to the space station and how it's populated and who are these professionals. People underestimate the fact that NASA is a branch of military. Um, that countries that are warring or at least are not allies here on Earth are working quite harmoniously in the space station. Um, come on, what are we talking about here? It's only the poor people who are squabbling on this planet. We're way behind the eight ball. We are way behind. So me talking about, man, we got to rebuild this workshop. This is the peanut gallery right there. We're way behind, brother. And and I'm saying we, we rebuilt a workshop is the peanut gallery and it's light years ahead of some sister. It's Saturday morning. Some, some, most black women are somewhere getting their mani pedis done, getting their nails tucked up, getting the light, the eyelashes and shit put together and painting faces and, you know, getting wigs installed. And, and I clean up all right. Don't get me wrong. But come on now. Come on. What are we doing? How is this functional? And, and I've raised a, a, a flock of children who will hit first. And I got some daughters who are glam girls like nobody's business. But I guarantee you, they know. Boots on the ground, nails clipped off. It's on and pop. They yeah. will hit first. And, uh, and if, if that's not that's not your mentality, I can't say that you're going to have the skin for this particular game. Some people want to be free. Some people want to be friends. They just want to be accepted. They just want to be liked. They want white people to respect them and value them and regard them. And I don't need none of that. I don't need none of that. I just want you to get out of my way. I I don't think people gather and and, and Doc definitely weigh in weigh in weigh on this because she's she's coming so fast that you got to kind of catch up. But I, I don't think people, I, I I don't think people get it. We talk all day about freedom, and 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 I'm feeling so vindicated right now because I say this so much, and then people are like, well, you know, you you no, you talk about freedom, but you don't understand the price of freedom. The, the, oh, the very nature, the very nature, the very nature of freedom is being free from. Yeah. See, you talk about liberation, but what are you freeing yourself from? Freeing yourself from the need to have or uh, earn the approbation of other people who don't care about you. Freedom from the dependency upon other people who don't care about you. Freedom from the need to ask permission to do for yourself. All of these things are what you're liberating yourself from. The freedom says, in order to actually be free, I can't give a damn. Yeah. And, 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 and that's hard for us because we were all taught to care. They push it on us. It's been a constant part of their theology is you can't really truly be if you don't care. You know, they push this unbelievable leverage of morality on us when they have no history of it. None. And, and what, But here you go, brother. You were taught to... I'm telling you, the indoctrination starts in preschool. Stop turning them children over to your enemy. You were taught to play fair. <laughs> you were taught to share. You were taught to be kind. You were taught, it's not nice to leave someone out. I didn't teach my children any of that. Hmm. I did not teach them that. I remember my sisters took my children to Disneyland one year. This happened one time. When they came back, they were gone for the whole day. And I didn't go, because I know I'll be the party pooper. Because I could find a whole lot of shit wrong with Disneyland. So <laughs> I didn't go. And so when they came back, children felt like they had a good time. I don't even think they remember going to Disneyland. Probably none of them remember. But my, my sisters, two of them took them and said, your kids do not know how to wait in line. And I said, uh, well, probably not. They didn't, they didn't have a point of reference for it. No, we kept trying to get them to understand that all these people were waiting to get on this ride or waiting to do this thing. I said, so what did they do? She said, 
They just started walking past people talking about, excuse us, excuse us, excuse us, and going past. She said, so eventually we just started following them. People were letting them by, so we would just go with them. <laughs> and I'm saying, we, we let our children go into these school systems that kill the warrior spirit before it gets started. And those spirits they can't kill, they suspend, arrest, they write reports on, they, they start, this is a problem child. And that shit starts in first grade. Yep. First grade. Right. They we go, use a legal terminology with a six-year-old. Right. And, and they're creating a criminal, they're, they're criminalizing, like you say, five-year-olds and six-year-olds. And they're, they're normalizing the criminalization of five-year-olds and six-year-olds. Uh, of blackwoods. Blackwoods. Specifically, black ones. Doc, we we, 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 pays. Right. we gotta be honest. Crime pays. Right. Hey, crime pays yeah. for our police forces. Crime pays for our judicial system. Crime pays for our mayors. Our hey, crime pays. They're not they're not producing more programs to cultivate better children. They're writing more laws to contain more people. And the ones who get caught up are ours because. It ain't the law that's the problem. It's that law enforcement is armed with this one little tool. Discernment. It's their discretion. Mm -hmm. They can enforce at their discretion. Absolutely. And their discretion is wired to be against your child, but the crime here's a big crime, brother. Every black adult raised in this country knows that and sends their unarmed, vulnerable, most precious child knowingly into that hellhole every day. And they say, But I gotta work. I have to this, I have to that. There we are. We don't want to take responsibility. We don't take responsibility. Nope. We want to say the problem is all this black abortion. That ain't the problem. That's not the problem. The problem is, honestly, and this ain't going to stick right with a lot of people, it ain't enough for them damn abortions happening. I can tell you that right now. And this is why it's going to sound so terrible. Because you tied your, your horse to a cart that had a flat. So you brought the kid here, tied to somebody who already didn't have a mentality, male or female, didn't even have a mentality to see this pass through. We throw in our children like logs on a fire. So rather than not bring the child here, rather than wear the condom, use the control, rather than any of that, rather than any of those options, we're gonna keep adding fodder to the fire. And, and, and we're doing that. And, 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 and I'm glad you brought that up. That's a very touchy subject, especially here in Texas, I know it is. because I they've know limited it. they've limited it here in Texas. Now, theoretically, a uh, 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 part of my philosophy, uh, and, 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 and it, it's also part of you know how you describe me and say one of, one of my hangups that I'm going to have to deal with is, is is being honest about the reality of this and getting out of the romanization of being able to save everyone. Okay, so. My philosophy is I'm not for abortion, but I'm not a person to tell a woman what to do, what, what to do with her body, first and foremost. Now, if it's mine, I want to have the option of doing it. But still, I got to ask you to put your life on the line to put me to that point. And that's the reality of it. It's something my grandmother told me a long time ago, son, you don't have a clue because they romanticize giving birth. They don't tell you that you're this close to death every time you do it. OK, so the first thing is, do I, can I really ask a woman to do that for me for something she doesn't want? But more importantly, when I start talking to pro-lifers, and I, I'm definitely not pro-abortion, but I'm not pro-life. Here's why. Because I don't like either side because of the lackadaisical approach to what the, the arguments they're making. They don't have a plan. Okay, here's my thing. You say you pro-life, but when they get here, what the hell are you doing for them? What kind of situation are you allowing them to be in? You study saying you want them to get here, but it's too many of them starving now. It's too many of them not having the resources they need to actually be a, a force in this world. You allow them to get here so they can be the footsteps to many. 
That's a problem to me. That's Am I what I'm saying? That's, that's what I'm trying to tell you, brother. That's the it, problem to me. It is profitable for these numbers to keep coming here. If you own the plantation, don't you want the babies to keep coming? <laughs> It's profitable, man. What are we talking about here? This is profitable. That it's profitable that there was a higher percentage of literate people coming from kitchen tables before public school was a real thing that was accessible to everybody than there are now. How do you have a public school education system like this country has and have the literacy rate this country has? If it's not profitable. It makes you money to but, show. But, when they tell you it's designed for seventy percent to fail the SATs. It's designed. It's designed for you to. to you got to funnel enough of them into the, the service sector. You got to funnel enough. Come on, what are we doing? This thing is systemic. It's well, not just a matter of who's in charge. It's a matter of what system are you living by. What system are you using? Right. To govern your life, and that's what we don't want to pay attention to. I, I'm not when I say it ain't enough of them happening, is because most people don't want to really pay attention to the real nitty gritty. I don't care what the laws say, abortions didn't start when the law said they could, and abortions won't stop because the law say they shouldn't. You just don't give a damn about women, you don't give a damn about women's health, and I don't want to hear all that crap that a lot of people try to say as policy makers about. The, the moral compass of whether or not this is a child when he has a heartbeat or this and the other. That stuff is not about any of that. It's about sheer control. It's nothing to do with, you don't have a battery of all males sitting here telling you that women should not be allowed to have abortions and think this is about anything other than strict control. And at some point, black people, black people, all black people are going to have to recognize the patriarchal use that we, the patriarchal system we're using to govern ourselves by is killing us. The last time we were healthy is when we were in matriarchal governance. Matriarchy lives by the governing value system of get something for everybody. Big Mama and them fed everybody's kids, no matter where they came from. Then there's a reason old women used to say mama's baby, papa's maybe. There's a reason we still see it. 2021, we still see people pick and choose, particularly dads pick and choose if and when they will father. We still see that. Not just if they've been taken away from. We still see people, young people, struggling with should you allow your child support payment to be used for all the children in the house. That's still a thing. You still struggling with that simple math? Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? We we over we over um we're overstimulated on bullshit and we're not anywhere near calibrated towards community. You don't really want community, you gotta be too responsible. Because right. when it comes to community, all the children are our children. On that point, all on that point, on that, on that point, um uh, I, I saw it and I didn't really want to acknowledge it at the time because you're on such a roll, but it's to a point now, this community thing. I want to touch on that real big. Then, Doc, I'm a, I'll let you two guys close it out and I'm going to sit back. Uh, community thing. Uh, I talked to my wife a lot of times. Say, Do you remember when we grew up? Not that it was perfect because we we don't, you know, I'm like, when everybody can talk about Cardi B, I say, I remember Millie Jackson. So, you know, the whole thing is the difference was Millie Jackson was the one that you knew was off limits and you really shouldn't have been listening to it. She wasn't the standard. She was the venture off into what could be in the possibilities. And we flipped the world. But the community thing that me and my wife talk about is, I say, I remember growing up in the hood and having the strictest parents in the hood, but having a community that everybody knew everybody. I could be four blocks over around the corner down the street with one lady who allowed her kids to do every freaking thing under the sun. If she caught me doing what she knew my mother wouldn't allow, she was exactly. coming from that porch and say, boy, you know, mama, you want me to go around there talking to Ms. Wallace? Mm -hmm. It was a community. You know, everybody had the right to check your child. Mm -hmm. and, and what you found is they weren't checking them because they want the home, and they were checking them because there was an understanding. We're not going to allow your kid to go out the boundaries that you set for them. So, the, in other words, your kid can't get outside of your reach, and you don't have to be there because the community is going to hold them accountable. And what happens now is everybody, like somebody, came on and said, "You, you know, when you 
talked about your warning on your door. Somebody mm -hmm. came over and said, well, you're not whooping my kids. But I get it. That's that, that's the new thing now. Nobody's touching my kid. The problem is now is when you're not around them, who's holding them accountable? Because they now know nobody can put their hands on them. Nobody can say anything to them. That's not true. See, people who take that position, uh, my kids, your seven-year-old ain't scared of you. I damn sure ain't scared of you. That's number one. And number two, you need to take your kid where that bullshit you raise them with works. It don't work here. That's the thing. The reason community expands your reach is you don't want your child to have what I got to offer. I think that's fucking awesome. You know where I think you need to take them? Right over there to that lynch camp. Yeah, take them right over there to lynch camp because the same one who say you, she wouldn't whip my kids. No, I sure wouldn't because your kid wouldn't be here, number one. Number two, them people that you know is coming, they're going to put them lights on them and they're going to whoop the shit out of your kid. If you get your child back, you weren't going to be standing on the news. I just don't understand. I need someone to give me answers. Why? Why? I gave some young ladies a ride uh, last year. No, 2019. There was a when a, a curfew started here surrounding um, a, yes, another of the many police killings that happened in the country. Some young people began protesting and they wanted to enforce a, um, a curfew here. And I had a problem with that. I'm fine with whatever they need to do, but you're not going to send me text to my phone and say, I need to be home at eight o'clock and this and the other. That's a problem. That's a problem right here. And so I just made the public statement. Well, uh, I'm a, I'm a go to the mayor, to the governor's mansion and see if he's home at around eight Oh one. So, I just want to meet you there. Let's go see if he's going to be home at 8 o'clock. And so a bunch of people decided, well, let's go see if the governor's going to be home at 8 o'clock. So that was an interesting turn of events. After we did that, there were some young ladies who I told them, if you show up at the governor's mansion, we'll give you a ride back to your vehicle. We took some young ladies back to their vehicle. And I could tell they were young, 18, 19. And I asked them, I said, does your mother know where you are? Because I knew we were in harm's way. This could have turned into a fight with the police, which was going to be nothing but ugly. No, not really. I said, let me tell you something. I don't care how good the car. I don't care what you're doing. When I'm saying, well, technically, I'm over 18. That's not the point. I said, you are the only one who can keep your mother from asking strangers for answers as to what happened to her daughter. You're the only one. Your mother should know that if something happened to my daughter, I know where and I know why. She should not be looking to those who did her daughter harm to be willing to tell her what and why it happened. She should already know. But we're the only ones who can stop that. We don't have a, a, a no kind of standard by which we conduct ourselves by, and we're not willing to live by it. And we're not willing to enforce it when it comes to our own people. There's a lot of people who will not like things that I say. There's a lot of people. But it's because they like the trinkets of this world. And I'm not telling you you can't have luxurious things. Because doing business is a very African thing to do. It's a very ancient and African thing to do business. Business means we trade what we have some of for what a what goes on in here we have some that we like you have some that you like and then we use that to add to the spice and flavor of our life but it doesn't mean what you have governs what happens in here we live by an aligned value system you don't want people who love your children to correct your children then you should by all means have a dose of the people who hate your children correcting your children See what I'm saying? We serve them up. See what I'm saying? Where do you think these dope boys come from? They mamas. They daddies. 
what what eleven year old should be walking around in two hundred fifty dollars shoes without a source of income of their own? You mean tell me a kid that not even responsible for buying their own drawers and toothpaste is walking around in hundreds of dollars on their feet? I that, never. That they're gonna outgrow. Oh, I, I just I just simply never. I, I didn't care if your feet stopped growing or not. I think all that shit comes from you. And I never gave allowance. I mean, I can't my children, I probably stopped buying underwear and no type of basic necessities when they were about 13 years old. You know, if you're not if you're not tripping on whether or not you got socks, I guarantee you I ain't worried about it. And it ain't even a conversation. We didn't even have it as a conversation. But how do you think an 18 year old suddenly gets the bright idea to feed themselves? They have no practice providing for themselves. Where is this going to come from? They used to wear the top designer everything, and, and people come with this warped mentality that keeps them from trying to get out here and slang dope to try to get it. No, it doesn't. It makes them addicted to that bullshit. It don't keep them from trying to slang dope. It makes them slang it or use it. Because now their, their self-worth and their value is attached to whatever label they can put on their back. I didn't teach my children that. To graduate high school, in my home school, you had to start and run a business for a year as part of the process. You had to start and run a business for a year. Fatima and Bilal are 20 years old. They still run the very company they started years before they graduated high school. Belux Builds, you can look it up online, beluxbuilds.com, B-L-U-X, B-U-I-L-D-S.com. That is a company completely run by two 20-year-olds, uh, a son who was completely cultivated in carpentry. He got his first tool for his second birthday. By the time he had to leave home, he had a full set of tools and a skill set he had a little piece of truck and whatever little dollars he had in his pocket. And I told him, that's your manhood starter kit. Get at it. Hmm. He's got a skill set to be able to feed himself right now. I shouldn't have to worry about can my grandchildren eat. As a child, I remember he wanted a set of bunk beds. He had to build it. I'll finance the material. When he got older, he wanted a king size bed. He dismantled his bunk bed and reconfigured it into a king size bed. I'm with it. I'm with all that. But mommy shop for clothes twice a year and zero times outside of that. That's just not how I, I produce these children. That, that wasn't the task I was on. And sometimes we overindulge children and people alike with trinkets and bullshit. Mm. No, I can't hang out with you. You're not in my fave five. When you look at the, the phone numbers in my phone that I call the most, them are the phone numbers that I can also call, hey, I need to knock this wall down. Hey, I need to pull these shingles off. And I mean, these are brothers and sisters. Mm. Brothers and sisters, if you can't educate your children, feed your family out of your cell phone, you know too many of the wrong people. Too many of the wrong people. And we don't want to live by that. It is adults who surrender. So mm. I'm all for that. Oh, yeah. He couldn't whoop my children. Yeah, I probably wouldn't even know your children. Because I can tell you, I'm, I'm just not that grandmother. Being around your children ain't a gift to me. And I'm an educator. You have not done me a favor by bringing your children around. I'm not a vampire. I don't gain more energy sucking energy off of them. I have blessed you if I take an investment interest in your children. You have not done me the favor. Sweet love, I have reared mine. Every child I brought here, I reared them. So any child I participate in the rearing of, you're welcome. You don't want what I have to offer, and I don't have what you prefer? Sweet darling, please take your shit show on the road. Well, Sister Latavia, we need what you have to offer, my sister. I wanna, want you to elaborate a little bit on how we uh, have the right balance as grassroots leaders. How do we have the right balance between the teaching the correction of our people and the encouragement of our people, and then we can wrap it up. What do we need? What do yeah. we need to be doing? What do we need to be doing? Well? We have a welcoming policy. Having a welcoming policy and a criteria that vets everybody who comes through uh, 
you know, we don't discourage our people from coming to us. We're looking for everybody who's looking for us. And we encourage them to come through that vetting process because it's how we determine that we are of aligned value. And when we have those aligned values, what did I tell you is the first study guide? Commitment is the key. Then you have to commit to the process of developing that relationship. See, when I told you Shelly Covington and I got 50 years in this thing, you don't get 50 years overnight. You get 50 years in 50 years. You know, commitment is the key. Commitment is the key. And and it's not a, a, a hard thought to say, well, you know, um, Brother asked me about how they can contribute. You should come in the door making offerings. You should come in the door making offerings because it is a courtship. It is a courtship. What do you bring? You've come over here because you know there's something you can receive. You see what I'm saying? Something in your mind lets you know that whatever it is we are doing, there's some of it that you need to benefit you and your family. We have no problem giving and giving very generously of that. But come with your offerings. Don't show up empty-handed. It is a courtship. Don't feel no way because you don't have free, unfiltered access. We don't owe you that. You are a guest. It's like coming to anyone's home. Ask before you go in the refrigerator, you know. Wipe your feet at the door. If they ask you to take off your shoes, please do. You know, brother, last time you were here, at our home, you uh, you you may have paid the toll of taking off your shoes, but I remember my daughter gave you some veggie pot pie that <laughs> I think more than compensated for that minor inconvenience. You, you get what I'm saying? So Absolutely. it's the little things. You you got to learn that there are protocols, and you might not be familiar with living by protocols. You might have it in your mind that you won't live by protocols, but if you want something that comes of value, then discipline is an honor. And I, I do want to share, I did look up the uh, our cash app to contribute to Her Living Campus. Is yes, that dollar we'll sign? That if you would, if you would um, yeah. Really now, how do I give you that? Yeah, just okay, say give me the dollar sign. Sage House. No fancy spelling. S-A-G-E-H-O-U-S-E. -E. Okay. okay. That's the Sage. cash app. Yeah. Okay, so I, I just put it in the chat chat line and then I'll I'll add it to the description once we close out and I'll go Sounds do right. uh the updating and everything. What's your most pressing need right now for for her campus? Oh, financial resources and sweat equity. We're in a deep rebuild. And so people with skills, carpentry, electrical, uh plumbing, cement, masonry, um any of those skills we need. Anybody that's got a pair of work boots, jeans, two hands for the gloves. We've got work gloves and, and protective eyewear. We got that for you. Sweat equity, sweat equity, sweat equity, sweat equity, and financial resources. Like I said, we've taken on a $62,000 rebuild and our sweat equity. And that's, that's just going to cover the material. We don't have the budget to finance this. This is not a luxury resort. It's an immersive uh, immersive learning environment. And because we all benefit, we have no problem asking for all of us to contribute. Absolutely. I do want to say there is the availability for people to come and learn camping skills. We do have a cabin that we do for retreats or if people want to book it, I'll send you that booking link as well. Do that. Um, yeah. They can find it on Groupon. We're listed on Groupon. We're listed on Hip Camp. That's another way you can contribute by being part of the programs. Uh, that are offered here. The number one program that is that is paused due to the workshops collapse is our Black to Nature program, which ran predominantly for preschool age children. And we need that program. It's immersive full day of safe space for preschoolers, daycares, kindergarten groups. We need that that program back up and running. Well, you will have my donation today, my sister. I've been supporting you for 30 we, years. We, that's I right. I know Dr. This is true. Dr. Wallace will continue to support you. We will we'll, we'll collaborate any way we can, and we hope the community will continue to support you. You've been at this for 30 plus years. That's right. 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 I appreciate you both. I appreciate the work you all are doing and the effectiveness that you have, even though I know there are times when it doesn't feel like that, but know that your voice is needed, your presence is needed, our brothers need to see you. 
our sisters need to see you. I can tell you, everybody will tell you how much young black men need to see quality, strong brothers in the community. Sisters need to see that too. Black women need to know that there are men who still love black women. I don't care what they say. Black women need to see that there are men who, and I just said this recently, I don't care how strong or independent she is, black women, we still want to know that brothers care enough to take care of certain things. And so when you care enough to even reach out and say, what do you need, sister? How can I help you? You know, even that is appreciated because there are so many sisters who have genuinely lost hope. They do not believe black women, black men want us. I've only ever had black men and I've been loved by some of the best of them. And most sisters, when they hear me say that, it's almost like I'm making something up. But I told you, I got a good eye. I don't do BS. I don't deal with, you know, ain't shit dude. I don't, I don't deal with that at all. Every man I've been loved by has been a quality brother. And I got to say, even my ex-husband, who I often say, I'm sure we drive one another nuts. We get on each other's nerves. But in fact, last time, was it last time you were in town or the time before that? Yeah, we, went, we went out. We to, all went to yeah. lunch together. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's the reality at hand. We still share community together. Right. We still had to rear our children together. And by now, if I'm not mistaken, do they keep coming to that door? He's probably out there. <laughs> I'm telling you that he's probably out there complaining. Is your mother still in that interview? Well, listen, why does she want this, that, and the other? Because he's out there trying to govern these young people. And I, and, and, uh, and I know time didn't permit. I wish we could have talked about uh, what you and I talked about. I told you how, I uh, told you and him how beautiful it was for me to see, you know, when I met you all, you all were married and, and had the that's bookstore, right. bookstore. And to see you all, uh, even though you weren't married, to see you all right. Yep the quality kids that you all have ro- raised with the entrepreneurial spirit and, yeah. and, and the black first uh, uh, mentality and everything. That's, that, that's very inspirational to me. Right. Thank and, you. And, Thank and, you. I, and I will close with this. You, 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 you've inspired a, a, a new term, a phrase in my mind, in your philosophy, in talking about your community. You said that we welcome them but we welcome them to, and, and they have to be ready to go through the vetting process. So you say you're welcomed, which means that this isn't exclusive. It's right. inclusive, but you got to go through a vetting process. And so the thing that popped in my mind was qualified inclusivity. The yeah. idea that you, 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 we want you here, but you got to come ready to be here. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so that, that that's accountability and responsibility to me on both and sides. Be, yeah. And be so, committed to help build. Right. That's right. That's the whole thing. There's, mm-hmm. there's no getting something for nothing. Right. Yeah, and, that door swings both ways. You know, right. if, if I'm coming to your home or coming to your organization, it doesn't matter what you invite me to. I have to be just as willing and prepared to sweep the floors and wash the dishes as I am yeah. sit on your panel or, or write the foreword of your next book. Or You, you understand what I'm saying? Right. I right. can't have a disposition against uh wiping the tables down or, or whatever is necessary. Right. And Doc, you know, I've always said, hey, there's something everyone can do. We all have a different skill sets. But if, that's you, right. if you if you don't have time to do the work or if that's not what your skill set is, we can all certainly donate something to the cause. That's know? right. There's exactly. money or like you said, whether it's sweat equity, uh, it's a choice to be on the sidelines because there's too much work that needs to be done. Right. I agree. And on the on, on on the on the parting note, Doc, I gotta give you I gotta give you a hard time about this because this is funny and it relates to last week's show. I'm watching you outside and you got the cap on and the hoodie, and I'm sitting over here with my cap and my hoodie. You know that lady told us last week that there's no way in hell that we could actually be doctors and hold doctor degrees because we're sitting up looking like uh looking like thugs out of the community. <laughs> with hip hop no. so you know very well you're not no doctor sitting over there with that darn old hoodie on. <laughs> That's that, what she that's said. Yeah, she she I mean early in the during all thing, I'm like, really? Where you come from? Yeah, you so you peep that out. You you see I purposely wore yeah, what I yeah. wear. I it's mean, amazing how we dress. qualify people by all the wrong things. Yeah. 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 All I gave you, and that that's where you're coming from. Okay, but I just had to give you that hard time. Sis, it, it, you you don't know. You bless me all the time. Like I told you. 
uh, you blessed me the first time I ever saw you. And I, 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 I shared this, I think, earlier. The first time I ever saw you, I was traveling and speaking, and I was all over the place, and I was so worn down. And I was sitting up, and you were on there, and you were already, you were in the heat of your own thing, and you were sitting up, but you were calling men to stand up. And, yeah. and basically, it was the thing I was traveling and speaking. She was saying it. My thing was, I said, you're not going to stop cops from killing our kids until killing our kids has a consequence. And, right. and, and, and she was saying that. But she said, in order to be willing to get that consequence, you got to be willing to get what's coming, too. And see, most of us yeah. aren't. And so yeah. that was that thing. And she's been expiring. That was, what, eight years ago? Yeah. And so ever since then, I've been, you know, I, I've been watching. And the thing is, she lives what she speaks. And that's all it takes for me. I, I see you living and walking what you're talking. That's it. My, my my grandmother told me a long time ago, son, stop trying to convince people who you are. You, you're doing way too much. Let the life you yeah. live speak for you. That's right. I don't think people understand how, you know, liberation living is not the glamorous thing. That oh. people- <laughs> and everything you see online and all of that stuff. When I was with uh, Sister Latave at her, you know, she let me know look at all this work that the being done. This it's is work. Hard, literally hard work. She it's puts work. Yeah. this work, man. I right. Mean, right. Uh, she's not a social media activist. She is a um, grassroots uh, scholar and activist and educator. She truly is. Yeah. My definition. Thank yeah. you for coming. I thank you both. I thank, thank you both for your hospitality. And we well, thank you all continue to have a fabulous Saturday. Uh, the job site is calling me. <laughs> you have a great day. I want to thank everybody else for stopping in. We'll see you next week on The Teachers. We're out. Peace and love, brothers. Peace. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in on you. This won't take long at all. I just want to let you guys know, first and foremost, that the uh, video that I had up on uh, this channel, Lil Nas X, decided uh, he's tired of being gay. Um, That, along with Viewers Demand Netflix, uh, pull Dave Chappelle's comedy special, uh, have both been moved to Rumble. Uh, The links uh, to check out those videos are in the description box. Also, uh, as we continue to do work, uh, which includes research, program development, uh, community community engagement, and much more, we continue to ask for your support. Uh, The links to do so are in the description box. Uh, I thought about doing a prolonged uh, monologue on the reason that I pull those down, uh, but I think it's self-explanatory. Uh, it's attracting the wrong element, um, and when discourse becomes disrespectful uh, and people are talking to talk uh, and not uh, communicate or to have a two-way conversation uh, but attack, I know that what follows after that shortly uh, is normally Uh, outside attacks and so just to kill the whole thing I pulled them down and I put them on a different platform you can still visit them you can still comment on it Uh, but uh, it began to detract too much from what the totality of my message is Uh, that's one small part of my message it's uh, necessary Uh, And I think that it's extremely important under the whole entire uh, complex dynamic of what we're experiencing as a race. Uh, But when it's made into what it had been made into, um, and when people take what you say and create narratives that never came out of your mouth, like gay rights aren't human rights, never came out of my mouth, but it became an argument and a point. Uh, and no matter what you say, it keeps coming out. So people are arguing from their emotions and not reason and rationale. People will demand that you provide them with um, empirical data from studies and research, but then give you uh, anecdotal observations that they've made. No studies, just, hey, this happened back then and this came up, so why this? But they won't. <laughs> A complete scholarly breakdown of why I hold the position I hold, which I can provide, but uh, I'm going to demand the same, and it's obviously that that can't be done. 
Uh, so again, if you want to uh, check out those videos, if you want to continue to conversate or converse uh, on those videos, you can go over to uh, Rumble based on the links there. And also subscribe while you're there so you can get the, st <clears throat> the stuff that's uploaded there and get notifications for it. On that note, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Don't forget to show your love uh, for the work we do by uh, offering your support. The information to do that is also in the description box. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable day. Yeah, yeah.